Mm, hi, everybody. How are you? Sorry, we're just getting everybody in here. Um, great. I see Holly. Thanks for your patience, everybody. We're going to get going in a couple of minutes, just waiting for more people to join. Holly, welcome. Hi, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, excited to have you all on the call today. Uh, let's see. I'm just letting a couple other people in. Um, let's see. Oh. Let's see. I hope everybody's enjoying today. We finally have some sun in San Francisco, but I think it's going to rain this weekend, which I'm not excited about. So I'm just trying to soak it all up before the end of this day. Okay. Um, let's see. Just letting some people in. We'll start at 12.05 um, just so that people have some time to join. Hi, Dom. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> it's nice to see you. So good to see you. I know everybody <laughs> virtually. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. We all see each other's homes now. Yep, we do. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let me give people one more minute and then we'll get going. Let's see. Okay. Hey, Holly. I don't know if you remember uh, me. We did the YC event in Seattle. Ah, uh, yes. I did the Q&A. How, How are you? Pretty good. How's Seattle? It is um, crazy. Um, mm -hmm. Lockdown, which is a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. But apparently there is a glimmer of hope. Um, we're seeing some flattening. Oh, that's good. That's yeah, good. Great. We will see that too. In oh. California. I hope so. Okay, um, let's get going. I'll continue letting people in as they um, kind of uh, trickle on over to our virtual meeting. Um, but thank you again, everyone, for joining us. We're really excited. This is our first digital event with AllRays. Um, so it really means a lot that you all took the time to join. Uh, I'm Katie. I run our digital community here at AllRays. Um, so this is just one of the ways we thought we could support you during these really uncertain times um, and we're excited to welcome you. Um, we had a huge amount of demand for this event. I think it was like three times the number of people, but we really want this to be an intimate and uh, vulnerable event for people who just to get advice that they feel like they can take away and um, take action from. Um, so that being said, we are going to have Holly start off with um, just like some background on her, um, what she's learned, um, her story and that sort of thing. I'm gonna ask that everyone like keep their microphones muted just because I know I have like random stuff happen in the background sometime with everyone working from home now. Um, and then once we um, get into the discussion part, um, people can unmute. Um, I'll be moderating conversation. If you have questions that happen or that come up during Holly's presentation, feel free to just drop them in the chat and I'll get them as well. Um, or just share when we have, um, when we end up uh, opening it up for discussion. Um, also feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, we love also because this was such an oversubscribed session, if you wanted to tweet out or share something after this event, um, one takeaway that you got uh, that can maybe help other founders as well. Um, a few things on Zoom. I'm now becoming a super expert of Zoom. Um, so if you want, you can pin Holly's uh, video while she's talking. You just go to her square um, and then there's like a three dot menu and it says pin video. Um, and you can also, when we go into the discussion, you might want to uh, change your view to grid view and that's over in the right top corner and it makes everyone's video show up. Um, 
So those are some things that I just wanted to share. Um, anybody have any questions before we start? Nope. Okay. So let's turn it over to Holly. Thank you again for being here. We're really excited. No problem. Thank you so much for having me, everybody here. It's so interesting being on virtual. I hope everybody's keeping safe and healthy. Um, so I, I think um, I'll, I'll give you the TLDR version, which is a little bit in the blurb of kind of where we were in my background. So my background was, um, I usually say we st I started a gaming company, but it didn't start out that way. It started out as a corporate social network and we exited it as a mobile gaming company. We pivoted probably about three times. My role in the company has been probably almost everything from uh, my background's been design in terms of product design, and then I ended up leading people um, when we exited. So pretty much we saw the company grow from zero to 1,500 employees with six offices in, around the world. Uh, we started in 2006, and we were not um, immune to 2008. By the time 2008 happened in the financial crisis, we had built um, uh, community apps for TV shows and sports teams on Facebook. And that grew so quickly. It was, the numbers were just like the pandemic, man. We were at a million users for probably within like two weeks. Um, Facebook itself was just kind of a crazy time. Uh, and that's when like Zynga came out and Rock You came out and all of that. And then in 2008, um, in October, everything came from to pretty much a screeching halt. Um, I remember this is probably our like most like acute moments, uh, but it, we had our Series B term sheet signed. All they needed to do was wire the money, and the day they were supposed to wire the money was the same day that Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns like basically collapsed, crashed to a dollar. Um, Sequoia sent out everything uh, or sent out that memo, RIP Good Times, and it was literally I was on. Um, it, it was in downtown Mountain View, is Castro Street, and there was a lot of startups that were happening there. It was pretty much decimated. Things were just decimated overnight. Because our community apps were ad-supported, uh, we saw basically $3 million contracts disappear overnight. Um, our business was screwed, uh, to say the least. And so I think for us, uh, it took us about an extra 12 months. I was just looking at this. Uh, it took us an extra whole year uh, to close our Series B after that. And it was probably one of the worst fundraising times we could have ever gone through. Um, so basically from that, we kind of looked at ourselves. This, this was the path we chose, and there's a lot of different types of paths, and I'm more than happy to talk about it some more. But it was pretty clear we couldn't build a profitable business being ad-supported. And for us, we pretty much got ourselves into a room and we're like, we could shut down or we could decide to pivot. And we wanted to stay in business. We said, ah, we, don't, we, we wanted to do this thing together. Um, and for us, we looked at like, I, I think like, since it was our third pivot, <laughs> um, I think we looked at like kind of very similar things in terms of like markets, like what was it that something people wanted? Like, how do we get to profitability quickly? Um, what were some of the things that um, we had core competencies in? So when looking at the markets, we're like, wow, there's this little company named Zynga that was just killing it on Facebook. They ushered in Farmville, they ushered in all these other things. And we looked at them and we're like, hey, you know what, we know how to build Facebook apps. We've been on it since the beginning. And so we started thinking about, well, what if we were to build games? And just at that time, it was also something that was a passion point, particularly for our CEO. He, I loved the typical Farmville games that were happening, all the casual games, but he felt like there was something missing. He's like, we really need some mid-core. He really liked games such as StarCraft, basically games for gamers. And that's when we ushered in a game called Kingdoms of Camelot. And um, we started building that um, while we were still trying to fundraise our Series B, we we're trying to hedge our bets. And um, so we started building that probably around June, July. We got that out in October, um, right about the same time we, we launched, or November, November. We closed our Series B in October, and I think November is when we launched uh, Kingdoms of Camelot. And that really surprised us because we didn't think that it would do anything, but we really had no choice because at this point, the community apps weren't giving us any extra revenue. Doing games like completely made sense. And at that point I was a designer. So as a designer, the hardest thing was building a product that was um, 
that had so many stakeholders. Like I had user goals, I had business goals, and then I also had ad supported goals. And there was just too many, too many people. Um, the coolest and most exciting thing was now I could build a relationship directly with my customer and we could actually build value for directly to the customer instead of building it for ads or just having this extra, extra type business. So, um, that was something that was really personally exciting for me within the company. Um, and so we ended up building the game and we launched and, uh, to our surprise, it was making money. <laughs> we were like, oh, this is so much better than trying to get all these ad impressions and people using and coming back and increasing our daily active users and started looking a lot into like monetizing and how to, can we directly provide value to our customers. So that's kind of what was going on in the business and in the fundraising world. Um, in terms of our team, at that point, we we're about 30 people. We did have to do some layoffs because we had set up our team to have like three or four people who were on ad sales. Um, we asked people, we, we were pretty upfront with people. Um, we told them, hey, we can do pay cuts. We cut uh, eating in the office, which is probably something remotely is an expense that maybe a lot of people can cut right now. <laughs> Um, and that really saved a lot. Like if you're spending like, I mean, nowadays it's like $20 per person per head every day, but back then it was probably like $10 per person per head. And then, um, we, we actually started this ritual way before kind of the crisis, but, uh, where we'd meet weekly. And then we added in a new ritual where on Fridays we'd have like potluck Fridays with themes and we had kind of new different types of rituals come out. But the most important thing was that I think because we were 30 people, it was small enough, we all fit into a room, that it was really easy to communicate and to just be really honest and transparent in many ways. Um, and it was pretty clear, you know, we all, uh, many of us who could take pay cuts did take pay cuts. I remember um, one of our guys in tech ops, he, he voluntarily said like, hey, I'll, I'll come, I don't need to get paid this much. And he got some more stock. Uh, in exchange, which was really great because in 2017, we sold for a billion dollars. So that's the plus side of everything is that the company that you create now during this time, if you can survive, you're actually thriving. Like that's how I feel. Usually, um, you know, <laughs> my friend said, you know, you can't claim the prize yet. You must be present to claim the prize. Like you can't win if you're dead basically. And I think a lot of times you, you, you hear this, this is so true. This is why they say get to cash flow positive as quickly as possible renegotiate all your contracts, try to increase your runway as quickly and as long as possible. Because reality is, is as much as like, I've been reflecting on this and thinking like, oh, 2008 crisis, it might be very similar, but it, there are many ways where it's so different, but the emotions and the feelings, everybody is very much the same on it. But reality is, is and I, I don't mean to scare anybody, but like, the, like, I feel like this is just the beginning. We don't know when the pandemic will end. There's so many unknowns. And like, who would have thought that this is the thing that would cause the next recession, that businesses would be shut down? Like literally, I had thought like, in the next recession, it would be play, things like DoorDash and Instacart that were discretionary type incomes uh, be decimated or de discretionary services, excuse me. Um, would be decimated, but in like things like Airbnb and Uber, things that actually provided livelihood would actually be the thing that would survive. I never would have considered that travel would be grounded. And that is something, and like basically business is shut down. And that I, I think it's pretty clear that we're in, like this is just the beginning. Um, we're in for a pretty, rough time. I don't, I don't know how long it'll last, but I, I'm, my, my opinion is that it's not over yet. Um, and it's, it's pretty clear because we're all still sheltered in place, um, mainly waiting to see how much infecting happened and if, if we, can, we can kind of survive. So, um, but the good news, the good news out of all of this is, like I said, if you can use this time to just to build a profitable business, that is amazing. And then when the markets, and when I say markets, there are two markets that's, that's happening. Your fundraising market from investors and your market from your customers. If you just focus on your customers and get profitable, like by the time the recovery happens, you're going to be in like such a great 
such a great shape to be able to go and kind of get to whatever exit or outcome that you're looking for. I, I, I really like in fundraising a lot to like surfing <laughs> where, um, you know, if you like to surf, you need waves to, to be surfing and you can't create the waves. They have to be happening. Right. But so those are kind of like the markets. And then on top of that, they have to be happening in your industry, right at the beach that you want to surf at. If you can't do it at the beach that you want to surf at, then, um, it's really hard. Right. So for example, for a while, blue apron, it was just a bloodbath. And now these days it's really terrible to be in travel right? Um, the waves are not happening in their industry, or you could think of the beach and the industry is the same. And then finally, this is the thing you have the most control of. And this is probably what I would recommend everybody be doing is like, when the waves come, can they go out and catch that wave? Can they get on that surfboard? So this is like really great practice for you guys. And I know it's really hard to go surfing, but there's probably many things you can do in the meantime, to surf when there's not waves, like, there's probably lots of things that that you can you can do which is mainly get to cash flow positive or profitability i'm using them kind of interchangeably and really understand your customers well or in our case consider a pivot um and that at the end of the day you're still looking to make something that people want but again um if you can survive this time you'll come out a winner you really will so at least i want to encourage you with that <laughs> i don't want it to be all doomsday <laughs> So I, I think I'll stop right there um, and kind of open it up um, unless like there's, there's other things. I'm, I'm more than happy to dive into a lot of different types of things um, in terms of, of different details. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so yeah, if people want to uh, unmute and ask questions, um, it's kind of hard because it's not like a circle or, you know, raising hands, but just go ahead and we'll field them. Um, I'll go ahead and start. Hi, Holly. My name is Juana. I'm the founder of Blue Bell. It's a small private label baby brand. And um, <clears throat> I'm not venture back and very much bootstrapped. And I wanted to know um, if you had any advice for alternative funding outside of the traditional venture back model, since I do have more of like a physical product I'm selling. Yeah. So unfortunately, my expertise tends to be much more in kind of venture backed. But before, mm -hmm. and I don't know exactly in terms of um, how these markets are doing, but in general, I'm realizing everywhere, even in public markets, like cash is king. Um, mm -hmm. But there used to be this thing called surge funds, um, which they would give out kind of like money based off of how much revenue you're pulling in. Since you're bootstrapped, I'm pretty sure you could get to profitability. Mm -hmm. um, in, in many ways, but the growth part is going to be very difficult during this time. Yeah. Um, and so this is where the advice of getting to cash flow positive and getting to profitability really speaks a bit more to the VC backed startups because they sacrifice profitability for growth. You're mm -hmm. a little bit in this reverse uh, phase to where you are uh, profitable and you kind of need to survive. Is that what you want to do or do you want to grow it? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I've been profitable for a while now, but um, it's, I mean, obviously things have slowed down. I went from having like my highest sales month ever to like a complete halt um, yeah. because of like warehouse and global supply chain. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to see if like, <clears throat> but I think that, that that is true. Since it is venture back, it isn't venture back, the profitability um, and scaling has kind of been in reverse. Um, so I guess my path forward is just to keep my head down and like um, hope I can qualify some for some of these small business loans. Yeah, the, the other thing you, you should definitely consider, and I would also say this for like tech back startups as well, is like try to renegotiate any kind of contracts you have to get money up front. And I know everybody's doing this right now, but it's like, hey, you know, there's, there's ways in which that maybe there's some creative ways where you can deal make right now to where um, you can get cash up front. Mm -hmm. That's what I've been seeing a lot of kind of entrepreneurs do. You also might qualify for the SBA loan more so than some of the tech startups. And I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in the stimulus bill right now, um, but you might be in that really great uh, kind of sweet spot, if you will. Um, I think, is, is it that your supply, the demand has gone down as well as the supply chain is all locked up? 
Um, yeah, because right now a majority of my sales is coming from Amazon. Um, and like people are buying my product, but it's not shipping for like a month. So yeah. um, I went from having like, like 30 orders a day to like one and it really just killed my cash flow. So I'm yeah. trying to think of ways to mitigate. Yeah. Is there any way to like change it from, I, I don't know what it's like to sell on Amazon and if you get any access to customers, but mm -hmm. if, if you don't like, is there other ways of like putting it on Shopify and do D to C and email them and you handle the fulfillment? I think um, I do have a Shopify site and I have been having more sales on it because of the slowdown with Amazon and just having them fulfill it from the back end. Run it through. I mean, the, maybe you could run it through us. I think there's one carrier that Amazon doesn't use and maybe run it through them. Yeah. Crazy demand. And the, the other thing you might want to consider is like um, a local, a local push. Mm -hmm. letting people locally know and then you can handle delivery a little bit easier if you're in a position to do local delivery might be a good, good idea yeah that one might be kind of interesting i think there's a lot of interesting if you're considering a pivot i think there's a lot of interesting things that will sprout in terms of local delivery yeah it seems like on it. Floor, and then you could get it fulfilled because there's probably babies around you there are a lot of babies around me okay <laughs> my supplier was joking that i'll have like a huge boom in about nine months Yes. <laughs> you could probably, I mean, you could get creative too. You can like, if you do have inventory, you could sell that inventory for a discount if they will pay you cash up front and say like, in yeah. like here's, here's what we'll do. We'll give you a welcome baby package. No contact delivery straight to your door or something like yeah. that. It's yeah. It's a really good idea. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, I see Tessa has her hand up. Uh, can you guys hear me? Hey, Tessa. <clears throat> Hey, Holly, thank you for sharing your story. Um, I wanted to dig in on one of the things that you said, which is that you had, uh, you're just about to close your B when the markets crashed. And then you yes. said it took another year to actually close it. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing that you had to do some significant action in that year to keep yourselves afloat. Yeah. Because it was a lot longer than you probably planned for. Can you talk a little bit about that? Did you have to do resource actions? Yeah, so basically uh, the, the team, the sales team of four or five, we pretty much had to lay them off um, or like they ended up taking huge pay cuts and we tried to retool them to build games, but they're like, no, we're, we're in this on this other side. We tried to save any of the contracts, like we did a March Madness app, um, which was with basketball and we 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 tried we had like these lingering contracts but the big one the three million dollar contract that one just literally disappeared overnight um so we we basically retooled our business into trying to retool it was basically we we're trying to do like several things at once it's kind of funny because i was just looking at like our grid from co like company history it's like oh we did that app too like we were trying like some different things so in the meantime, what we had done is we took our sports, we shuttered our, our TV community apps because it was pretty clear we couldn't monetize directly. What we did do with our sports apps is we ended up um, really retooling that to become fantasy because it was very fantasy sports because it was super clear that fantasy sports were, um, were you know, there was a direct way to monetize. And um, the thing is, is like the only problem with sports and seasonal contact is like, our, our content is that it's seasonal. So you don't really know um, what kind of will end up happening like when it's August or like we're like, we think live scoring will pay. And then actually our luck was like totally sealed too. We were going to charge for live scoring in fantasy football. So there's, if you're not familiar with fantasy football, that was a very direct way to monetize from the people who signed up is you could pay like $9.99 a month to get like scoring earlier. So then you can change your strategy very quickly. <laughs> and Yahoo, one of the largest fantasy sports people decided to offer it for free. And we're like, oh, who's going to pay for it now? Especially on Facebook, we're all doing everything on Facebook. And we all knew at that time, like these are college students who were like kind of poor. Um, so we were having several things in flight for sure. Um, and um, I think our bigger bet just happened to be uh, the game that we started. And it wasn't that exciting of a game, but it was definitely something that had a little bit more 
more than just like a click farm um, that Farmville had. It, it was a bit deeper. So uh, we had to change the ad supported business, like anybody that supported it, we had to, to basically lay them off. We tried to do salary, volunteer, volunteer salary cuts. Um, and then we uh, no more kind of like these extra perks, which was uh, food coming in um, every day. Uh, we cut that. that. That is actually quite an expensive cost. And then the frustration part of everything was um, eventually as we got bigger, we brought the food back. But there was just like, like the exec team would always constantly complain about all the entitlement that had happened from that. We blame Google though. We're like, how can we compete with Google? They give massages, they give all these things. I'm like, back in my day, you had to bring your lunch. Um, so that, that, those were kind of the cuts we had to make. Uh, I don't know if that answered your question more, uh, but it was really on salary. Salary is going to be probably your largest burn really. Um, and then, so that's, and then the ones that just didn't fit. And then the perks is, is something like all those expenses you can, you can kind of sort out. Yep. I do recommend as you get larger, well, just even if you're smaller, if you're going to make a change, try to do it all at once. Otherwise it's just going to be a malaise of things. Like if you know it's going to happen, just, and it's very, very hard. Trust me. I know it's ripped the bandaid. That's what I've heard. Yeah. It's really, it, it is really hard. It is. <laughs> Thank you. But you'll thank yourself for it later. Any other questions? If not, I had some submitted questions we can go through. I have a question. This is sure. Rokna. I'm a founder of Flavor Cloud. Um, basically, international shipping, we make it easy for D2C brands. Um, and so my, uh, so it's been an interesting time for us. I feel like you in might general, be, it's like we have sorry. two, I said, I feel like we, there's two forms of startups, some like ed tech, delivery, shipping. Those are probably yeah. like off the roof. And then the other ones like, I don't know, daycare. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So um, and actually, it's a very interesting time for us. So business is uh, pretty much, I'd say, it's unpredictable because it's a spiky, but uh, we're on track. Um, and so the interesting thing that has happened, thanks to FDA, I know I had a question. Um, my suggestion was going to be use Shopify Fulfillment Network because they're getting an influx of everybody in F FBA that's not being serviced is now going to Shopify Fulfillment Network. And yeah. so, so we're actually seeing influx of sales. So we're doing all kinds of things. Um, interestingly, on the other, other side, we're seeing this um, growth. Um, but my question was more so about, um, I started fundraising the first... <laughs> Uh, first set of meetings that I started doing was the first week of uh, March. Um, <laughs> so the first two weeks were really interesting, like things were going fabulously well. And um, then, uh, you know, for the last uh, 13, 14 days, it's been a little crazy. Um, yeah. I had terms yanked and also I'm in like much later stages of partner meetings yeah. um, with various folks and things have dragged on a little longer. Um, that's an interesting time. So I Are know- Are you um, Series A right now? What, what so stage? So we're raising a 5 million, some say it's a C, some say it's a A. So what? it's basically a five, I'm calling it a five. Um, <laughs> and yeah. so it's a little, um, a little unfortunate right now. You will see a lot more delays. Yeah. You'll see people either yank, and I know there's a lot of people out there who are like, don't yank, don't yank, but it happens. Um, yeah. And it's hard because I'm like, yeah, I see both sides. I think mm -hmm. like the, you know, if they've, uh, you know, like our investors, they were just, they were scared and they like totally screwed us over and we were so mad at them for the longest time. On the mm -hmm. flip side, I was like, we would have been stuck with like a dwindling ad supported business too. Like that's the main reason why they wouldn't support us. Anyways, long story short, um, I, I think that um, the best way you can probably create urgency, either, either way you're going to create some urgency, the best way you can do it is if you can get two people to the table still mm -hmm. and just kind of force like force each other's hand of like I'm closing and that's even in good times that's the mm -hmm. best way to kind of like force people to move on your time frame yeah it's kind of like close it now it has to be kind of a, a real 
meaty kind of other offer because yeah. you could be left with nothing and you're like, well, I guess I can't. Yeah, the, the, the problem is the ones that were meaty got yanked. And so now I'm like all in this stage of final meetings and some more interested um, that I think are likely, but now I'm unsure because a lot of the responses are basically, at least the ones that yanked, that were so gung-ho the week before. We're like, we're gonna go back and prioritize our existing portfolio companies that are just leading. Right. And so a few months later, we can talk or, you know, another one said, you know, rest of the year, we don't we're not going to look at a new investment. Yeah. And so given that, I don't know that the regular dynamics of how you force closure really would help. Um, and yes. if it doesn't, then, you know, it's really about, so I have runway for seven months, but really, I want that to be more like a year, of, yes. 18 months, 18 months plus. Right. Yes. Um, so uh, it's more about saying, okay, if, if for whatever reason I get a similar response from the other set of uh, conversations, then I have folks that were, you know, follow-ons. So is there a, a way to create a syndicate? And if so, how does that work? Yeah. So um, let me double click a little bit on your follow-on question. Like, are there previous investors that are like, I, I'll go in once you find a lead? Is that what you yeah. mean? There's, well, there's previous existing investors who will help me do that as well. Uh, I've kind of told everybody else that said they want to participate in a round, but not leading. I set them aside and I said, I'm only focusing on leads at least yeah. the initial weeks. And now I'm thinking, what should I do? Yeah. So it, it, it is a little rough. Um, it, for you, you've been at it for like two or three weeks. It's still a pretty short three time, weeks. Yeah. Like three to six months. But so, so oh, okay. yeah, you, yeah, usually like I was hoping time. to get this done, like <laughs> actually in four Maybe. weeks, but <laughs> really at least spot. a commitment. Yeah. You're, you're in a really funny spot cause you're not quite serious. We usually say three to six months for like a series A, okay. um, you know, I will say because I've, I've been close to YC, um, you know, we, we always say this is your, like after that, so for some startups, absolutely right after the week of demo day, they're closing left and right. And the second week as a partner, we're always like, don't give up, don't give up. Mm -hmm. It usually took them like about three months, you know, like on average. And that this is good times. So we're always like, so yeah. there's a part of me where I'm like, oh, maybe through, because you're also seed in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, that means there's more investors out there. So mm -hmm. I will say that there's a, a couple of things. So I'll caveat some, some of the things like, I was talking to a friend of mine, they run a, they're mainly a series A, but they do have seed. Mm -hmm. um, and she was saying that she's still making investments, but she also, I've heard, uh, she, she's like, but when it's the right time. So they'll do, do it very slowly. And they've always done this kind of slow in general. Yeah. I've also heard from other founders like yourself, many of them have been like, we need to put this to our current portfolio companies because we're kind of stuck mm -hmm. with them in some ways and we need to make sure they're successful three weeks does feel a little bit short so like there's a part of me that's like oh don't give up you know okay. keep on going um so i want to like encourage you with that particularly because i think you have more to choose from yeah. um in this and like you should leverage your existing investors as much as possible on this one okay. one thing you might want to consider is if you're not doing a term sheet you could consider like a convertible, like using either raising on a safe or a convertible note, okay. one of the two versus like, but I, I wouldn't make that decision exactly right now. Mm -hmm. um, but I think- Well, the people say you got to close now so that you have runway and then, and that's kind of- Yeah, yeah, yeah. if you with, can uh, close now, that would be great, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. it's almost like you should use the bank robber strategy, take the mm -hmm. money, <laughs> take the money. Yeah. I mean, you should definitely talk to them, but like, if yeah. they're like decent and good, like mm -hmm. this is where everything kind of switches to like, if you could catch a wave, catch it because there's not a lot of waves out there. Right. Um, yeah. but three weeks also feels a little bit like even in good times, you would, if, if you were my YC founder, I'd be like, wow, don't give up. Like it's only three weeks, okay. um, and leverage your existing one. And now syndicate you can absolutely do a syndicate if you want to. Um, but I would probably see how these kind of like shake out in some ways. Um, and kind of see, it's just know that it's going to be tough. That's the thing. It's just tough. Um, but three, and you can definitely leverage, if your business is growing a lot, you should totally be like 
sending this out there and just like hey, reminder airbnb was built during this kind of time like this is exactly you know what i mean like these are the exact companies like ed tech companies will find like delivery companies anything that you can kind of show that this isn't just an anomaly in terms of a spike like i know the delivery companies are going to be spiking and this mm -hmm. is going to be great for business but this is the plan in the future of so many ways so i the, I think it's just, it will be delayed and it will be slower. And it sounds like you kind of, you can't afford to give up. Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to be like, yes. you're going to have to continue. Yes. Yeah. Sorry Thank to hear you. about that. Heidi, um, Heidi, did you have a question? Move oh. on to the next questions that we have so we can try to get to everyone. Sure. Yeah. Heidi, did you have a question? I saw you clicking. I don't know. Anybody else? Holly, I know that I also sent you some questions too. Yeah, so I submitted in advance. Yeah, I can start going through theirs that those unless other people and then if other people just want to raise their hand on kind of what if they had other questions. Yeah. Oh, Heidi. You have I to think unmute you're muted, Heidi. Okay, I can help you. Yeah, we can't hear you. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, I dialed in, so I thought it was the other one. Um, but so our, you know, customer base has been enterprise, and so our, you know, time scales for getting in, we work in auto, it's long time anyway. Um, we were about nine months into, like, you know, a, a 12 to 18 month sales cycle. Uh, I've kind of seen that be, you know, like, I don't see that as a good pathway forward. It's not going to be indicative of all of uh, being able to survive. So I'm wondering how do companies, like if, if we do enterprise sales, how do we look for new markets with shorter time horizons, being that we are like a, you know, essentially a, not deep tech, but like core tech company. Like how do you Is navigate there, that side? So here's a strange question. Could you kind of um, not sell to enterprise? Can your business be sold to uh because in by the nature of enterprise, they just behave very slow. They move very slow. So you have that like molasses on top of that. If you can get to kind of organizations that move a little faster, can your tech move more towards like medium businesses, um, getting them more revenue very quickly or smaller businesses that are on the brink of something and it's like, hey, this is this will get you more revenue? Um, I've been trying for that, but so just as background, we work in, you know, robotics and autonomy. And so that's, there's not many companies of that, Got um, it. you Do know, you just tell me briefly that size. does, uh, so we basically, we work on, uh, providing QA for AI. So through simulation. So we started on autonomous vehicles and basically work within that we felt to ensure this kind of the long tail of the business model um, that's a hard market anyway to be able to work with insurance companies or slow moving so um i'm looking right now at you know what are options different ways to pivot um kind of coming up to the front of the development stack um working on more image recognition um qa as opposed to simulation as a potential to say we can expand out our market segments wider yeah, I mean, that's probably what I would consider is like, basically, you're creating QA for some, like, you're in the synthetic data world, and you're testing their AIs. Autonomous vehicles are already so far out that it's already hard and um, difficult to, um, to kind of sell to. Some of the things you might want to consider then is changing your markets altogether and not go into automotive and not go into autonomous vehicles. And instead, look for things where, uh, where they're already using kind of, or maybe they can replace like some, some of the things that's been kind of interesting that I've seen, like in the past, I've always felt like, oh, these things, it's just going to like detect deep fakes and what kind of business is there. But there are ones that I've been seeing that's been kind of interesting where uh, they'll take either image recognition and they'll um, be able to help on fitness and your form and they'll train the AI and they'll do QA on it. I don't know how quickly that will sell, but it might sell even more in this world because everything has to be remote, right? So like you have these fitness teachers who are now like doing this from home, but like there's no feedback on, the, the great thing about a class is they can see my form and they can like give me feedback. And maybe they can via Zoom, 
but it's not really quite there. I know you're thinking like three different levels down. So it's like, you probably have to play the game at different levels of like, can you bring some type of value all the way up into an industry where it's hurting? And in some ways you, you might, given how everything's remote now, you might be able to do some really fun and interesting stuff that because now everybody's online and it's really hard to do certain things offline, you, you have this thing to be able to mimic either mimic and QA it or literally mimic it and create like feedback on the fly of like my form is off or um, there's another company that's creating like synthetic images for models, right? So the person doesn't have to be there. I don't know how booming that industry is, but it's just like trying to break different ways of like, because I, I feel like I've, I've heard and seen a lot of these companies do what you're doing and it's always for autonomous vehicles, which is like so far out there. And this is the first time I've been hearing companies doing something that's like literally, hey, this is like a burning question right now or a burning problem. So uh, one way of also assessing that is to maybe go back to your customer de like development set and just kind of um, ask them what, what is something that they would pay for right now kind of thing and maybe rebuild, retool your thing for that and get like really obsessed about the problem that they're having. Yeah, so I think we make developer tools for them, but the problem is it's just the procurement process and the sales cycle is too long for the big company. So that's like, you know, but I can go back to the developers and like work on those things, but smaller ones. So, um, but one of my follow-up questions on that is you mentioned that like focusing on kind of the needs of users right now, since we are in this like lockdown period and everything's remote and virtual. And one of my hesitations there, and I'd love to get your opinion on is like, by focusing on this current market, like what if it flips tomorrow and they come out like, you know, either a vaccine or, you know, politically they're like, we're all gonna go to work anyway. You know, like, so I'm, I'm trying to like, wrap my head around like okay well how how much do i take the current market as the future I market see. i see yeah so this is something that i it, it's it's going to be hard to predict like some of the changes like it'll fundamentally um do and sometimes i feel like yeah i feel like the most accessible kind of business to build right now is a delivery company but like at the end of the day how how sustainable will it be? I don't know. Um, and there's a part of me where if it's too easy to build, then it won't last very long. It feels like what you're doing is that it's it's um, it's okay that it's highly needed. Even even in ed tech, I think ultimately a lot of the remote stuff will be here to stay. This is this is the bet that you're going to have to spend some time thinking about. Like, is remote going to be here to stay? If so, to what extent? I have certain beliefs about like startups will be done remotely. It was already happening. It, this was just this extra push. And like me as a business owner, I'm like, if I don't have to, like, not that I don't want my employees to be happy, but like if I could save money on rent, if I could save money on like food and I could dump that back into the business, absolutely. I mean, there's different ways I would give perks, um, but like, could that be plausible? Absolutely. Is there ways I could build community? Absolutely. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, so I think, I think when you're thinking about like, is this just a flash in the pan problem? Like I'm surgical masks, um, water, all those types of things. I think you might need to dig a little deeper and say like, what, what kind of human need am I fulfilling here? And I know that sounds a little philosophical, but you might, you might just have to play that out as a thought exercise and then make your decisions based off of that. Because after all, they're all hypotheses, unfortunately. I, I wish I could predict the future. If I did, <laughs> there'd be so many things I would tell you. It's hard. Holly, I wanted to ask, um, I know we got a couple of questions about team morale um, on uh, the submitted questions. Can you talk to that a little bit? Um, and then maybe take, if you also, if you all have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat too. Um, I'm monitoring those as well. Okay, um, I'll speak briefly to team morale and then I see one around Tessa. Tessa's question around fundraising. Um, so the nice thing is my team was already, our team was really small already, it was 30 people. Um, so a couple of things that I think is important for team morale is first like being kind of honest. You don't have to show like 
all the financials. In fact, like somebody had asked like how much money was in the bank and I, I couldn't even remember, but we knew it was a, a situation where, oh my gosh, it's, it's dire. We all need to tighten our belt. And it was pretty clear we lasted 12 months. So um, it was certainly um, some foresight, particularly from the CEO to be like, hey, this is, this is the time. It was, it was certainly foresight in May. So um, in May when the product was doing well, uh, we're like, hey, the fundraising market looks good. Let's go fundraise. And that was a bit prescient um, to kind of just start going that. It was just poor timing on like when it was closing, but it was absolutely great timing to go out and try to get some money because uh, our product was well and the market was doing well. Uh, when it came to like team morale, some of the things that's been kind of nice, and you probably see this a little bit with the family that you're quarantined with or the people that you're quarantined with, there's a little bit of some foxhole camaraderie. And some of those things are like, one is having honest and open communication about like the state of things, right? And kind of like, if you don't know, you don't know. At the same time, you have to be, you have to have some type of strategy in place for sure. You can't be like, oh, this will magically disappear. Don't worry, just hang in there, right? Like you can't have like too much positive toxicity. It's what I call it, too much positivity. Like you have to be kind of honest, but you don't have to be um, also like this is a doomsday scenario and that's where your plan comes in, right? If your plan is a doomsday scenario, then rip the bandaid off and do the layoffs and do all the hard decisions. But you should absolutely be honest with um, what this looks like. Um, when we, I think when it was probably pretty clear that the ad supported businesses were, were or the ad supported people were going to get hit because it wasn't quite clear. We we're trying to keep everybody in general. We we're just trying to keep everyone. Some of them ended up quitting because they're like, it's going into games. Like we're, we're not, we're not going in that direction. Um, some of them we probably did cut maybe like one we had that conversation with. Um, and at 30 people, it, it was so much smaller. The second thing I would recommend is considering time for like rituals. So it's it's a little bit of a different time right now. Um, but back then we could have face-to-face -face stuff. So on Fridays we'd have potluck. And then in the afternoons, um, we really liked board games. So, and for some reason, our team had an obsession with the chicken nuggets from McDonald's. So like people would make a run to the chicken nuggets and then for like two, probably two Christmases in a row, we literally had an in-office party. Like it was just, it, it wasn't anything fancy at all. And before that, our fanciest stuff was going out to Dave and Buster's, going to do all these other things. And then it just became over the top. Like, I'm more than happy to talk about it when it gets like bigger and the times are still good. Like you still have to be really careful on managing your burn. Um, so in terms of team morale, like absolutely what we did was if you were to cut your pay, we gave you options. So now cash is king. So you can certainly reward people with stock options and people that stay with you. Because if you think about stock, it's high, like who would have thought <laughs> like it would have been so highly valuable, right? Um, so you can absolutely do kind of a trade. That's what we did um, with a lot of people who decided to take, with the ones who decided to take a pay cut. We said, here's some, here's some make good um, if we could. So, so things are kind of flipping. Things flip into the favor of the investor. Things are flipping in favor of options versus cash because you, you want to conserve your cash as much as possible. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the hardest thing um, right now. And then I, I, we haven't talked too much about debt. We did have a line of credit. I don't think we hit it. I don't think we dug into it. We might have, we might have, but those, those things that you've created on the, the line of credit, those are like the fail safe type things. Getting credit right now is, is, is a little tough, I would say. Um, everybody's in a credit, like that's, that's, if you can get the credit now, go ahead and just be very wary of like what the payment terms are and everything, because those are the first ones to get their money back at like a steep price, right? Um, the best thing to do is get profitable and kind of build the business, but that's always very, very difficult. Um, but yeah, so in terms of the, the team morale, communication, creating new rituals. Oh, I read about this one ritual by the Shippo founder. I thought it was kind of cool is they created a channel in Slack called food and everybody reports at lunch what they ate in a picture. 
Like it could be something as little as that where it's some type of digital thing, or it could be something as little as like, um, you know, it was so funny, me and just one other, me and this other engineer, it was really cute. She always loved stickers and she would write every task on an index card and give herself a sticker. That wasn't like a crisis type ritual, but like there could be things that kind of show up out of this and you could get like super creative. It could be like a, I've seen people do like um, some lip syncing on um like I don't know some type of like maybe it's karaoke Fridays and everybody gets in and they sing together something that's going to be different and unique to you guys and the team will enjoy like it should be something the team enjoys <laughs> their wives this is kind of pure judgment but it like any type of touch points that kind of show you're in this together right I mean definitely none of the founders were taking pay increases we were all hunkering down yeah so I hope that answered some of those questions. There is a question from Tessa. Should I just pick up that one? Um, so Tessa had asked, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but in your estimation, when do I think VC fundraising ecosystem will return to quote unquote normal? So I don't know what you mean by normal. If normal is like crazy times, like in at like right before the pandemic, it'll take 11 years, right? To get back to the, the crazy times. Um, again, for us, this is like just one data point. It took us like, I, I remember this actually, uh, my co-founder, he had just called me about like a couple weeks ago when the pandemic was, was going and he was like, hey, is everything okay? And he said something kind of interesting. He, he would remember this probably because he was much more on the front line um, during fundraising. He's like, it took at least six months to even start having conversations again. Like, and like in six months, like the recovery, maybe the, not only will the recovery start or the recovery will be back in. Oh, I see a little visitor. <laughs> coming in um yeah hold on a quick second sorry no worries that's totally fine um also if you all want to hear i was thinking that maybe mental health might be another thing like how do we keep track of like our mental health but go ahead holly because this is important as well oh yeah, yeah yeah so oh sorry to normal and then it took us uh 12 12 months to close our series b and that was still incredibly lucky because it was from a a betting, it was called Betfair from the UK. And for this one, it's very unclear because everything's just shut down. So it's like how, and then how do we come back online and are things, things will probably happen in stages, I would imagine. I don't know. So um, I know Gary from Initialized is encouraging people to get at least 18 months of like cushion. And that's not bad advice. I'm like 18 months plus, if anything, at least we survived for, for a whole year. Um, so that, that was something, um, that, so 18 months, I, I will, I will throw this out here and it's not to just scare anybody, but I feel like if your business is just kind of decimated and it's very unclear how it will come back, like if you're in the wedding industry <laughs> and it's like required that you must be present or events, um, I'd really consider a pivot. I know I'm, I shouldn't be speaking pivots out there, but I would really, okay, Dom's like putting her, like, I don't know if it'll bounce back in six months. And if it does bounce back, will the demand be there? Like, that's something you really have to think about. Um, and like your question, um, Tessa, where it's like, to get it to normal of what it is now, it took 11 years. That's how long it took. And that's just, it's just crazy times, crazy times, right? We were all waiting for the other shoe to drop. Who would have thought it would have been a pandemic? Well, the scientists did. And then um, very quickly on mental health, this is something that I, I'm super grateful for in that um, in the last two or three years, I feel like tech has started talking about this. And um, I think it's something that's always been important. And I've noticed, just speaking from personal experience, it's, it's kind of there still. You don't leave like and it's just an extra layer of anxiety and dread so if you already struggle with anxiety which i do like this extra like form of stress just kind of adds to it um some of the things that i i'm a huge fan of and like returning to is 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 do do your mental health practices like one, one of the things for me that um i've picked up dropped picked up and i'm so grateful that i did during the time of the crisis was I journal a lot of my prayers. Um, so I grew up in the church, so that's something that's very important to me. 
Um, but journaling in general, I've, I've realized like, wow, like just the other day, embarrassingly something happened and I got super smoked and it had nothing to do with the pandemic, but it just feels like every emotion that I'm personally feeling right now is just 10 X, um, at the same time. And during the financial crisis, it was definitely like 10 X. Like I went back to my journals and I was like, Oh my God, I remember this. I remember like just quitting and moving to China and taking care of panda bears maybe, or, um, just like everything feels like 10 X. And if you can, if you could keep some of your mental health, like practices, um, and your wellness practices during this time and like kind of cling on to them, like you'll be so grateful in the end. Like I clung on to journaling, um, and, and kind of doing the, those things. And then there's a lot of great types of like tips to help keep you grounded in the moments of feeling anxiety. Like, I don't know if any of you do any type of breath work or just, you know, taking like a few, three deep breaths and then recognizing the emotions that you're feeling without any judgment. And I think this is, this is where women have been judged for centuries. So we're so used to being judged that we even judge ourselves like, oh, I shouldn't be angry. I shouldn't be anxious. Like just snap out of it and come out with a plan. But like allow those feelings like to kind of, um, to, and to label them and to not judge them, right? Um, I think that's one thing. And one of the tips I've been practicing on is instead of saying like, I am angry, like I say something inside of me is feeling angry. So you could kind of distance yourself a little bit and not judge it, right? And then you could start thinking very clearly, right? Because um, that, that's the biggest problem. Like, it's like your emotions are there to, to be felt and it's probably trying to tell you something, right? And your thoughts are there to be managed and your actions to control. That's the only thing you can control if you're even lucky is your actions, right? Um, so uh, kind of allow those things to be um, what they should be. Um, so I absolutely take mental health breaks. Like I'm a huge fan of those and they might look different. Like um, one of the things I've realized is like, um, I do some hand washing rituals now. I don't sing happy birthday or anything, but like one of the rituals I end up doing that I really enjoy is called savoring. And you just feel like enjoy the rubbing of the two hands together under warm water or thinking about some gratitude for like when I'm doing my thumbs of some sorts. And like, these are the things I can be grateful for. Like what a great time to be quarantined with the internet working, you know, like, oh my gosh, this is great. Right. Yeah. Um, so, and it's, it's, we're all in this together too. Like there, there is that. So yeah, hopefully that was pretty helpful. And it looks like we're a little bit out of time, but I don't know if yeah. anybody had any more burning questions that I might be able to answer in a rapid fire way. If not. Oh, yeah, I think ending on gratitude is like wonderful. Um, so thank you, Holly. Thank you everyone for coming as well. Uh, we really appreciate it and hope the session was helpful. Um, but thank you, Holly, for being fabulous and very vulnerable. Absolutely. And um, feel free if you guys um, want to reach out to me. I'm just Holly, H-O-L-L-Y at foundermusings.com. Um, and so just just feel free. I'm more than happy to to try to connect with you guys offline if you think it will be helpful. Thank you, everyone. Have Bye. a good rest of your Friday. Thank Thanks. you. Bye.